Hello, Namaste. I'm Ruchira Gupta, your host for the podcast A Free Voice. I'm an Emmy-winning journalist who went on to start Apnea, an NGO which works against sex trafficking. I have dedicated my life to amplifying voices of the most marginalized people in the world. I'm also the debut author of scholastic book I Kick and I Fly. In this podcast, I will talk to survivors, activists and storytellers who use their voice to make a difference in the lives of young people. How does an idea turn into action? How do you change a tragedy into recognizing your own powers? Together, we will examine and reimagine the world we want. November 12th, 1968. Care of American Express Amsterdam Holland. Dear mom and dad, received three letters from mom today and they were very beautiful and made me very happy. I've been reading a book called Black Skin White Masks by a brilliant psychoanalyst Franz Fanon. You should read his first book, The Wretched of the Earth. It is one of the most important books around. Fanon quotes from Amé César, a great African poet. And then, one lovely day, the middle class is brought up short by a staggering blow. The Gestapos are busy again. The prisons are filling up. The torturers are once more inventing, perfecting, consulting over their workbenches. People are astounded. They are angry. They say, how strange that is, but then it is only Nazism, fascism. It won't last. And they wait, and they hope, and they hide the truth from themselves. It is a savagery, the supreme savagery. It crowns, it epitomizes the day-to-day -day savageries. Yes, it is Nazism. Just before they became its victims, they were its accomplices. That Nazism they tolerate, before they succumbed to it, they exonerated it. They closed their eyes to it. The Nazisms they encouraged, they were responsible for it. And it drips, it seeps, it wells from every crack in Western Christian civilization until it engulfs that civilization in a bloody sea. <sighs> Dad, I urge you to read Fanon. Write to me, I love to get your letters. I often talk of you to the people here to tell them of all of the love and learning you have given me. Love, Andrea. You just heard an extract from writer, director, producer Pratibha Parmar's newest film, My Name is Andrea. My Name is Andrea is a long form hybrid documentary. It features Amanda Steinberg, Soko, Ashley Judd, Andrea Riseborough, and Christine Larty. It's a long labor of love. It has been executive produced by none other than Eve Ensler and Gloria Steinem. It's had a huge impact already. And this is just one of the many things that Pratibha has done as a director. Her films are always about giving voice to people on the margins. She's a storyteller. She uses different methods in filmmaking to tell stories and has pioneered paths forward for women filmmakers, for South Asian filmmakers and for feminism in film in ways that none of us could have dreamed about two or three decades ago. Pratibha also teaches filmmaking at the California College of the Arts right now. Thank you, Pratibha, for being with us. Now, the extract that we had just heard from My Name is Andrea, what is the context of that letter? 
So yeah, that was uh, the extract that you heard it was uh, voiced by the actress Andrea Riseborough. And, um, you know, the film, My Name is Andrea, as you said, is a hybrid documentary drama. And so it really interweaves um, archival footage of Andrea Dworkin's lectures and speeches uh, and her talks with dramatizations that I wrote using Andrea Dworkin's own words. And Andrea Riceborough and this extract that you heard was uh, really uh, taking place at a time in Andrea's life when she had left the US and was living in Amsterdam. So the film really uh, is divided into kind of five chapters of her life and each decade of Andrea's life is covered by and dramatized by a different actress and so the this particular chapter was what uh, Andrea Dworkin experienced while she was living in Amsterdam. She'd gone to Amsterdam after having a horrific experience um, in New York when she had been arrested the ha- at the House of Def- detention um, when uh, she was uh, protesting against the Vietnam War. And uh, she was held in the house of detention and brutalized sexually by two doctors in the name of doing a medical examination. And she, Andrea, found her voice in, she challenged them, she took them to court, and eventually the house of detention did, um, uh, was uh, closed down. But this particular extract was at a moment in Andrea's life where she was at this turning point of becoming somebody who's becoming exposed to uh, different ways in which and different kinds of ideas, European ideas about freedom and about protest and about anarchy. And she was doing a lot of reading at that time. And I, and she wrote a lot of letters to her mom and dad. She was incredibly close to her family. Um, and she wrote constantly to her, her parents. And these letters are included in this particular chapter to give us a real sense of what Andrea was experiencing as a young American woman living in Europe. And I think that, uh, as she says, you know, her exposure to writers like Franz Fanon and M.A. Cesar were very pivotal th- to her formation uh, as a kind of a feminist and as a political activist. And I was keen in the film to show the formation of a white radical feminist uh, public intellectual and a thinker and a, such a game changer that was the her influences and her formation came from multiple sources and that you know her reading of Fanon her politicization uh, was very much embedded actually through not just the readings but also her activism uh, not just in the anti-Vietnam war but when she came back to the U- U.S. she was also involved with the civil rights movement and then the Black Power movement. Uh, And there's another, you know, section in the film where she talks about how uh, this particular photograph of Huey Newton when she was uh, he, he was arrested kind of com- has this incredible impact on her because she sees in Huey a defiance against the police that she says she never saw in her own fa- in her own face when she was trying to resist the beatings the she she got married to this guy in Amsterdam and then and she was very much in love with him and she was very happy and then he became an abuser um, and. I think that that, you know, is, uh, that's kind of where she just was like, what is happening to me? She couldn't understand. And she thought it was a personal problem. But actually, um, a friend of hers in Amsterdam, Ricky Abrahams, gave her Kate Millett's book. And, um, you know, she read Kate Millett's book and she said that it just completely, the light got switched on and she realized that, what she was experiencing was not a personal problem, but it was a political problem. It's interesting that you mention Kate Millett because uh, the studio where we are recording this podcast is the very building that Kate Millett used to live in. That's amazing. <laughs> you see, in the Bowery. So many- 
<laughs> yeah, there's so many circles, right? Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, how wonderful to hear that. Yeah. I wish you were here in person because I, we could have walked up and down that street and imagined all those times. Yeah, absolutely. I know it would have been wonderful. Um, I think that, the, you know, there was just uh, in the 70s, there were just uh, such a vibrant kind of moments happening. And, you know, a when Andrea returned to the US uh, from Europe, I think she became very much involved in the women's movement. One of the things she said to her friend Ricky before she left uh, Amsterdam was that, you know, having realized and learned that there was, you know, a social political movement uh, for women's liberation that was so vibrant and happening in the U.S. She said that she uh, she promised Ricky that she de would dedicate her life to changing women's um, uh, for fighting for, for women's equality and fighting for women's rights, and that she would make that her life's mission. And I think she did you know, with so many of her books and her lecture tours and speaking at political rallies. Um, I think that's what she did. And I think one of the things that I wanted to do with this film, which is, it goes beyond a uh, traditional biography. It's not just a biographical profile of an interesting intellectual feminist activist from the 1970s, but it actually was very important to me that what she had to say about patriarchy and about institutionalized misogyny um, was, is something that is also relevant to the contemporary moment for uh, women. And that what she had to say is still, unfortunately, so absolutely relevant now more than ever when there is such a war globally going on against women and women's bodies and the control of women's bodies by patriarchal misogynist institution, whether that's through theocracy or that the, whether that's through the kind of anti-abortion laws that are being enacted all across the U.S., Absolutely. It's like as if we are fighting for every part of our bodies. I, you have partially explained that this is why you made Andrea. So you saw this moment coming in a way that, uh, you know, there of course is a revival of us, uh, you know, reading Andrea Dworkin again, uh, thinking about the subjects that she spoke about and how she analyzed them. But you, you decided to make the film almost a decade ago, I think. What was it that triggered you or drew you to Andrea? Yeah. Um, it was actually about eight years ago. So, you know, it was like seven to eight years ago, I decided to make this, started to uh, think about making this film. I, I think what drew me to Andrea really was her writing and the incredible passion and poetry of her writing. Uh, you know, here was a woman who wanted to be a poet this is what her life's ambition was. This is what her desire was. And all along the way, soon she realized how this ambition was being and experienced these obstacles in her way. And a lot of that, a lot of those obstacles had to do with being sexually assaulted. I mean, when she was 10, 11 years old, she was sexually assaulted in a cinema and no one would believe her, including her mother. And so she said, you know, I decided then and there that I was going to be a writer and was going to try and find words that were strong enough, that were clear enough for me to be able to persuade people of my truth. And I think that part of her life's journey was very much about uh, wanting people to believe her, uh, you know, and that's something that so many women struggle with because when they say they have been raped, they are not believed. When they say they've been abused in the hope in their homes by their husbands, they are not being believed. And it's the credibility always of women's truth that is all being questioned rather than just saying, yes, this woman is sharing with me what happened to her. Let's see what we can do about it. And I think that what attracted me to Andrea's writings was that she was able to articulate these kind of very um, – interior struggles that women women have in uh, in being able to voice what what has been done to them uh, the violations that have been that have taken place and i found her writing really powerful um and 
you know, it was such a surprise because I didn't really know who Andrea Dworkin was, but I knew of her. I knew what I had heard about her. And what I had heard about her was, oh, she hates men. She's so radical. She is, a, a, you know, uh, she she isn't willing to compromise. She is all, all of these things, which kind of amounted to uh, a gross misrepresentation of who she really was. Um, you know, there's a European cultural critic by the name of John Berger, and he's he wrote that Andrea Dworkin was one of the worst misrepresented. Uh, writers of the 20th century. And I think he was absolutely right because when I started to delve into Dworkin's life, then I could see that there was so much more to her than this uh, st the stance she had on pornography. She was anti-pornography. She was known as an anti-pornographer, um, but that's all what people know of her. And, you know, when I, the, her writings are so much have so much depth and expansiveness in terms of a world view, you know, and she was kind of intersectional in so many ways before that word was even in common usage as it is right now. Um, and I think that I just uh, thought one of the things I thought was that why is it that when women speak the truth that they are vilified, that they are misrepresented, that they are neglected? And um, I kind of started to explore that uh, as much as how do we women come to speech through the writings uh, of Andrew Walkin? I understood the journey that women have to take uh, in order to find a voice to speak about the unspeakable you know, most often. Um, and I think that, you know, it's so interesting when we premiered the film, we had our world premiere of the film this year, earlier in June at Tribeca Film Festival. And um, it was just a fantastic response to the film from the audience. And after the screening, I had a number of young women come up to me and say, you know, tearful and say, thank you so much for making this film, because this is like the first time we feel our story is being told as survivors of sexual assault in a way that is not sensationalizing it, but it is from within our experience. And and I think that that, that's, that was really important to me that, you know, the film is also in service to women to give some healing too, as much as a voice to uh, 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 around these issues of uh, patriarchal violence. Very true. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. I've called my podcast a free voice, precisely because of that. Because you know, we have to go through troubles and trauma and uh, so much more gaslighting, as you were talking about, to even know first of all that we have a voice. And then to be able to use it to give voice to others is harder. And what you have done, Pratibha, through my name is Andrea, is of course um, given voice to your own analysis and uh, desire to provide a free voice to others. But you've also given voice to Andrea all over again, who was looking for her own free voice after she was sexually assaulted and insisted on becoming a writer and a poet. Um, so, um, you know, this has, like, I have many free voices in this particular podcast, uh, which is beautiful. And uh, you have always chosen uh, people, stories uh, who have made a difference, who have been in the margins, but somehow they have um, changed the center through their writings by just uh, getting people under the skin. The other person whose uh, film you made, uh, who, on whom you made a film, was Alice Walker. Beauty and Truth. And what was that experience like, um, you know, chatting with Alice, following her around? She was the writer of The Color Purple. And uh, you were talking about um, race at a time which is... Um, as you can see what's going on in the United States today, uh, you know, at least now there is, uh, you you made the film even before Obama got elected as president of America, right? So you were still making visible the invisible and giving voice to someone who had found a voice and amplifying that voice. So what was that whole experience like, not just making the film, but meeting Alice as a person and then the impact of the film on race relations? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the way uh, the my documentary on Alice Walker came about was actually primarily uh, through our friendship. And I had met her uh, much earlier before I made the film on her uh, when I was making a film in the early 90s called A Place of Rage. And it was a documentary about uh, African-American women and the civil rights movement. And at that time, I was living in London and the film, the documentary was for Channel 4 Television in England in the UK. Um, And I was really particularly interested in making that film because I wanted to sort of show how uh, the role that African-American women played in shaping the civil rights movement and the black power movement. And, you know, it featured Angela Davis and it featured June Jordan. And through June Jordan, I met Alice Walker. So I had included an interview with Alice Walker in A Place of Rage. Um, And so, and then a few years later, Alice Walker approached me because she'd written this novel called Possessing the Secret of Joy. And it was a novel based on a a, a woman who had undergone uh, female genital mutilation. And Alice uh, sent me the manuscript before it was published. And she said, here's what I've been working on. Um, And I'm really interested in making a documentary, going to Africa and meeting with women and making a documentary about uh, uh, female genital mutilation. So I then, you know, explored this area. Of course, I knew about it and I read her book, which was really powerful and moving um, and uh, started to do some research. And of course, I said, absolutely, let's make this film together. And she was an executive producer on that film. And that was called Warrior Marks. Um, And we made that film and, you know, it was a tough challenging film to make and we you know I I was very um I was really committed to centering the voices of women in uh, Senegal and in Gambia who we were working with as uh women who were fighting and uh against FGM women activists African women activists on the ground doing the work of uh, trying to eliminate FGM so the film really focused a lot on what who these women were and what they were doing and Alice was the person who was meeting with them and you know I filmed her meeting with them and talking to them um it was, yeah, as I said, it was such a challenging film to make that we really kind of, in a way, bonded around, um, you know, just this kind of very emotional experience and journey we had been on. And, you know, uh, the then we'd also published a book about the making of the film, etc. cetera. Um, and, and then a number of, fast forward to a number of years later, and, you know, uh, I was visiting the U.S. and I was watching U.S. television and I was, I looked at this, um, series on PBS called American Masters. And, you know, the profiles of Americans who've made a big impact on uh, American culture. And there was, at that point, there were so few women that they had, um, you know, featured. And I just thought the most obvious thought was, why don't they have an American Masters on Alice Walker? She is absolutely a game changer and she has made such an impact on American literature and she should be part of this canon of American masters. Um, And so I wrote to uh, Alice and I spoke to her and I said, would you be interested? And she said, yes, sure, why not? And then, you know, then began a, a journey of making that film. So that's, that's kind of how the film came about. Um, and I would say that, you know, because of our friendship, the interviews with Alice for that film, you know, many people would say to me after watching the film, I feel like she's talking to me as a friend, as an, in the, as an audience member. And because she was talking to me uh, as as a friend because we were friends and so when I was interviewing her I wasn't this kind of journalist who was a, an outsider talking to her but I was kind of very much coming from within the part of her life and I think it gave it an intimacy to the interviews um, which a lot of people appreciated. 
and what do you think the impact of that film has been because it's been shown widely and uh, you know across continents and what do you think its impact has been both as a film and its impact on race and feminism and other social justice issues sure um i think the impact has been you know enormous i think but it's always hard to know except when we you know show the film in person at festivals uh, film festivals uh, and places where we are able to be present to see the impact um when the film premiered well we had the world premiere of the film actually in london at the queen elizabeth hall as part of a women's festival on culture at the south bank center queen elizabeth hall and it was incredible the tickets sold out within hours and it you know there were 900 it's 900 seater the queen elizabeth hall so it sold out within hours and on the night the organizers were forced to uh, put on a second screening uh, because there were so many more people waiting in line who couldn't get in and i think that was because people are really eager to hear um someone like Alice Walker talk about race and gender and culture and creativity in from a long point of longer point of view not just from the current moment because Alice Walker's life stems from being the daughter of sharecroppers in Georgia growing up on a plantation shed literally um to then becoming a pulitzer prize winner the arc of that life story is an inspirational arc uh the arc of that life story is also an arc of a woman committed to social justice through her literature through her writing and i think that um alice walker herself you know over and beyond the film has been an incredible sort of um inspirational model for so many people and particularly women and particularly african american women um and to be able to show the film globally um you know it's just i think that people everywhere can see and be hopeful that you, we do not none of us need to accept our given circumstances that we can fight to change uh what we have been boxed into or bracketed into that we can fight to kind of uh you know be fully embodied fully creative human beings and that it is possible to be that uh, i mean it is very difficult and it is very challenging but i think alice walker's stories it shows us that you know you can go from being the daughter of uh, parents who worked all the hours on a plantation or in a chicken factory uh to then kind of finding a, a path through all of that to go on to be a writer to be able to make an impact in the world your own story has been one of struggle and uh, standing up for what you believed in right but also for your own rights could you share that a little bit for our listeners today sure absolutely um you know i it's so interesting to me because people see that i made all these films and they're out there and of course they're not all you know even the alice walker film you know it showed on the bbc it showed on pbs it showed at film festivals but we would have liked to have had it on netflix or we would like to have had it on different streaming platform so it was available more widely and weren't able to get that um i think you know um my journey as a filmmaker really came also came out of my experience of being uh, a a daughter of immigrant parents uh, in the uk my mother worked in a sweatshop my father had a job as a clerical officer uh you know they we i saw my mother working till midnight every day uh for 10 cents a pillowcase should be sewing and we'd be cutting them off at the end and piling them up because the man was coming at in the morning to pick them up and this is how she fed us and kept us going um and for me it was like trying to understand uh, the nature of the that 
class exploitation, then coming to live in England as a 12-year-old immigrating and being treated in a terrible racist manner. I learned racism the first few days on the school playground when I was being called a Paki in a wog. And I was like, oh, but I'm not a Pakistani, you know? I mean, it was just like, I learned really fast. It was the, at the height of the skinhead movement in the UK. Enoch Powell had just made a speech of rivers of blood, you know, and we arrived in this very hostile style landscape. And so I had to, you know, I became politicized without the language very early on, uh, just through my own experience. And it was actually when I was a teenager and I read Angela Davis's book, If They Come For Me In The Morning, which is a collection of writings. And and I was completely, you know, like Andrew Dworkin read, read Kate Millett, Sexual Politics, and got completely ch- turned around and changed and politicized. Well, reading Angela Davis was just completely a turning point for me in my life. And, you know, I'll never forget that moment because she gave me a language to be able to speak about what was happening uh, to my mother, who's being exploited as a working class immigrant woman. Um, it gave me a language to understand racism and what was happening there. Um, and so I think that, you know, my sort of uh, passion for change really comes from being uh, uh, having experienced all kinds of discriminations. But it also, I think, I often think that it's also in my DNA because, you know, my mother told me a story about how, um, you know, she lived in India before she was married and she lived in India and she was at college, at a girls' college, and how, um, you know, when Gandhi was fighting for independence, um, they would find out that, you know, a, a, a train was coming by near their town with all these British soldiers. So they, the group of girls would go out in the middle of the night and they would derail the railways so that the British train with the British troops could not go through without some inconvenience. This was part of their nonviolent strategy for British independence. So my mother was very much an activist in her own way when they were fighting for Indian independence. So, and I, I think that, that it's probably in my blood to kind of fight for change and fight injustices wherever I see it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's been, um, you know, a tough road at times too, because, you know, I came out as gay uh, in, in the 80s, uh, 1980s, and uh, made documentaries about South Asian queer experiences, like I made this documentary called Kush, uh, which was actually a celebration of our sexuality. Um, and uh, it was a really fun film to make because I went to India and met with, you know, Indian LGBTQ people. And um, and it was a celebration of who we are. It wasn't kind of saying these are all the problems for us, of course, but that we are joyful about who we are. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's cost me my family, um, you know, that it's the uh, not being included in my family in and, and feeling like an outsider, not being really accepted. Um, and on top of all of that, of course, you know, I fell in love with a woman who's Muslim or was of Muslim background. So here I am, you know, brought up Hindu, you know, and, and I, I'm breaking all the taboos here, Richie, right? <laughs> you know? And so it was uh, um, in the joy, there has all, also been the struggle you know. Absolutely. And you're a hero to all of us because we see you do it and do it joyfully and um, find something at the end, which is beautiful. Um, You know, now you are in California and you are very close to the Redwood Forest and not far from Angela Davis, uh, whose book was a life changer for you. Have you ever met her? Oh, yes. Yeah, I see Angela quite frequently and uh, our paths cross and we do hang out. And uh, yeah, I mean, Angela continues to inspire me. She travels so much, still doing speaking tours. And she's still, you know, is uh, she's uh, really involved in the anti-abolition movement, or, uh, you know, and, and sort of the cast uh, really exposing the kind of imprisonment and what is happening in prisons uh, right right now across the US. And I think that, you know, 
she she's gonna and continues to be not just an inspiration but she continues to give so much of her life force to enacting change and you know what i love about angela davis is her joy and her hope she's or remains hopeful that change is possible and that we can make change uh, if we all come together in order to kind of effect change uh, and she's also it's just great fun to hang out with <laughs> i'm sure she's told you that you are a hero to her well i i i mean i would never allow her to say such a thing to me <laughs> <laughs> maybe even i'm sure she feels that too because we all tell each other stories and just listening to you i remember there's a book that angela wrote called freedom is an everyday struggle and i find it so relevant today because i was born in a post colonial india where there was freedom all around me you know and people like your mother were people like my father they'd all you know been to jail fought for um, freedom from british colonialism um, they were creating a new india women were emancipated they got the vote along with independence you know everyone was out in the public and rich were trying to do what poor people did and the poor were trying to do what rich people did and men were trying to do what women normally did and women were trying to do what men did so there was absolute fluidity in different ways and it it also led to a burst of creativity and building of um, national wealth and there was also a simplicity and hope in life then and yet you know 75 years later both in india the country i was born in and united states the country that i live in i find that uh, you know we are challenging the very same hierarchies that we uprooted 75 years ago like we'd got rid of fascism we'd got rid of feudalism we'd got rid of colonialism we'd created the united nations you know it was there was the universal declaration of human rights uh, you know there was uh, in the us constitution's preamble there is in line after line like dec declaration of about equality and every man being free and women and here we are again you know talking about discrimination talking about slavery making a comeback about racism which is based on like everyday violence which has got so no normalized that as you said the prisons are full of black men and uh, who are then also cut off from the right to vote so democracy itself is under threat now and what is the story you would tell now what is going to be the next movie you would like to make Um but the next movie I'd like to make is a narrative feature uh based on this incredible book YA book called I Fly I Kick um written by yourself Ruchira <laughs> that would I would love to do that um because it's such a amazing story of triumph against all the odds and it centers a young woman um so it has all the ingredients that attract me to storytelling um and so yeah i think that that would be uh, i ideally in an ideal world that would be my next film um so from your you lips it. to all the <laughs> studios years uh, who we are talking to and uh, you know hopefully it'll become a film and inspire lots of women to kick and fly yeah because the time has come to kick back yeah absolutely i absolutely agree i mean i think that you know women have always been kicking back but there has over the years as you said you know they became the particularly in the west i think uh, western feminism kind of uh, uh develop a certain kind of complacency uh that you know we've sort of arrived we've got these rights now we don't need to fight and you know start talking about like Sharon Souls were talking about you know uh leaning in feminism so kind of the co-option by corp corporate america of feminist ideas i think neutralized a lot of the rage and the passion and the anger and that it has suddenly sort of come upon women that oh my goodness i can't decide whether i want to have a baby or not the state is going to decide that i think there's a whole new generation of much younger women who are now fighting back who are now organizing 
that's true you know while uh, there are these uh, this feeling that you know it's absolutely authoritarian undemocratic tyrants who are taking over governments at the same time what i've noticed is exactly what you said very young girls you know standing up to the most uh, authoritarian leaders fearlessly like the girl in iran who's dancing on the streets with her head scarf off letting her hair flow in the wind and she knows that she's going to be beaten up and she knows she might be killed but she's dancing on the streets looking absolutely free and that's a huge message and inspiration i also have seen the whatsapp uh, and instagram uh, video of the 12 year old who went to in grand rapids to a whole group of men in city council and spoke to them against gun violence and she said when are you going to stop the guns from getting into our classrooms or another young girl like malala who uh, you know who was Uh, shot down for trying to study and today she's finished a college degree in oxford and is helping so many other girls study or greta going on and on talking about climate justice and building so many sisters and brothers across the world who are fighting for climate justice so i have seen such an upsurge in very young people who are coming to the fore and articulating their concerns about environmental justice about gun violence about abortion rights about um, economic inequality about unionizing when they see their parents suffer you know either in an amazon or somewhere else and they are reading they are talking to each other they are even going out right now to enroll people to vote and they are talking about voter segregation and they are saying if we don't participate we won't have a seat at the table and if we don't have a seat at the table then there will be more erosion of our rights so you know people are speaking up in india for example there is a rise in uh, hindu muslim marriages it hasn't gone down because people are resisting they are saying why would you stop us from marrying whom we want uh, and also intercaste marriages so you know young people don't want to um, others to dictate to them about love or reproduction or books to read the book bans in america are being defied by young people who are going and sitting in libraries and picking up the very books which are banned so uh, there is hope in that and the only thing is of course there's still 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 which means like we have to wait 10 years and the 10 years are a tough 10 years and uh, what can storytelling do in these 10 years while the young people who yeah. are going to be our leaders grow up yeah well i i think storytelling is so fundamental to um not only how we view the world but how uh we see ourselves and i think that if you have stories that show us different ways of being in the world the sh- stories that inspire us to take action stories that tell you that you are not alone i think stories that empower people that heal people um i think these are the, this is what storytelling can do because it can help to collectively say to people and for people to feel that there is hope that if so and so can do this and that's maybe just in the story that they see on the screen then maybe i too can do that um i think that we have to show uh, uh we have to model through storytelling different ways in which we can live different ways in which we can have a more egalitarian society and more equal culture where women and men and trans lives are, are you know everyone's lives are valued and are equal and and i think storytelling can have that kind of major impact um on people where do we go from here i think we continue to do what we do you know ruchi you you are doing amazing things with your work and you know your writing and you know um we continue to uh fight for change in in the different ways in which we can through our creativity um as much as sort of you know uh speaking about it we you know are actually active around it by telling stories in different forms um and saying look look here this there's a way in which we can 
enact change or this is why we need equality. And um, I think that we just have to uh, continue to have hope um, and continue to be creative um, in, in the kind of stories we tell and how we tell them. I know right now you are living in Berkeley in California and uh, you um, love the ocean and the redwoods. And you say that, you know, there's a quote by a Spanish painter, Joan Miro, uh, which you sums up what you desire and what makes your work more, both memorable and life changing. You say you can look at a picture for a week and never think of it again. You can also look at the picture for a second and think of it all your life. What is that picture? Well, it's all extremely individual. And that's kind of what I try and do with my films is, you know, I want audiences to look at my films and find that one thing that, you know, that, that impacts them, um, whether that's just uh, one interview that they hear or one image that they see. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, for me, it's not about churning out content as we see so much of our media churning out uh, all kinds of things you know which it's like um you know bubble gum you kind of just chew it and you throw it out uh, for me my filmmaking is about uh my films I want them to be evergreen. I want them to be films that people return to time and time again and say, uh, seeing different things in them and, and getting, you know, inspiration from them, getting some healing from them, learning new things and new knowledges or listening to people they've never listened to, seeing people that they've never seen. Um, and, and it's not about it just being looked at once and then consumed and thrown away, but that, you know, I wanted to, have, all my films, I, I've always start, not started with, but I always, as a filmmaker, my intent has always been to make some kind of an impact. And I know you also have a chance to help other filmmakers because you have a chance to vote for the Oscars and you have a chance to vote for BAFTA and many other awards. So what is it that you look for in those films? Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not a member of BAFTA anymore. I have been, a, I'm a member of the Academy in the US. Um, and you So know, you get so to vote for the Oscar. Yeah, and I get to, and it's a really privileged position, and it's a very, you know, I, I take it extremely seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, I because I know myself how hard it is to make films. Um, so uh, I, the films, you know, the way the Academy works is that you're, I'm in the documentary branch and I get allocated certain numbers of films to view every year. Um, and I, I make the time for that and it can take days and days to view some of the films and kind of come up with a short list and everything. But, you know, there's so many different things that one can look for in a film. And, you know, um, it, it's, uh, it's, I think there are just some incredible filmmakers uh, making some really interesting work. Um, not all of them get their films seen and I think that that's part of the challenge I mean you know right now our challenge is to try and get distribution for My Name is Andrea I mean we had after coming out of Tribeca we had the top critics we had the New York Times calling it a gem. The New Yorker picked it out as the highlight of the Tribeca Film Festival out of over 100 film. Uh, the uh, Hollywood Reporter did a fantastic long review of it. So we had some really incredibly strong reviews for the film, yet we still have not found a distribution for the film. Um, and we're still looking for that distribution because of course we want beyond film festivals we want the film to be seen by a much broader audience you know so i think independent filmmaking is uh, continues to be a challenge and it's getting tougher and tougher you know just just this week or last week, Variety did this long piece on how there are so many independent filmmakers right now really struggling to find distribution because, you know, Netflix is undergoing a huge challenge and kind of they've lost a billion subscribers or something. And so they've had to let go of a lot of people. So there are very few streaming platforms and there's 
you know, and it's highly competitive uh, to try and get your film on there. And, you know, our film, My Name is Andrea, is um, not a traditional documentary. It's not immediately commercial. It's not seen as being immediately commercial as a film. Um, and it's hard hitting. It's about violence against women. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, we're trying to push the uh, imaginative um, sort of uh, the imaginations of uh, distributors to say, we know there's an audience for this film. And it's not a risk that you would be taking with it. Um, it. There is no doubt that there's going to be an there is an audience for it. We know it from film festival screenings, where m most of the screenings at a lot of the film festivals have been selling out. You know, so, absolutely. And you know, yeah. art is always about meeting the moment. Yeah. And if the streamers would only understand that, that you know, if you meet the moment, you're bound to get more audiences. Uh, Exactly. And your film has met the moment. My name is Andrea. But I know that you also use different means and me methods to tell the story in film. So you've also made rom-coms and you've also recently made an episode, I think, for Crime Patrol. And no, 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 no. It wasn't Crime Patrol. I was going to say that when you first introduced me. Um, I directed an episode of uh, Law and Order SVU uh, earlier this year. Yeah. And how how did you make those choices to do a rom com and an episode for Law and Order? Um, you know, I, I um, one of the things Shaheen, my partner, always says to me is that that you you forget that you're a very versatile filmmaker, and I think that that's what I am. You know, I am a versatile filmmaker, and I like telling stories, and I don't like to be just. I don't like to think of telling stories just in one genre or in just one format. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I made a, a, a romantic comedy called Nina's Heavenly Delights about family, food and love and with Bollywood music and dance and all of that set in Scotland, in Glasgow. Uh, I made that a number of years ago. Um, and um, I am now doing more uh, episodic directing because as an independent filmmaker, you know, say with the Alice Walker film, that took seven years. My name is Andrea's taken eight years. You cannot sustain yourself as an independent filmmaker. There's no money in it for you. You know, you can, you're not paying yourself anything, any grants or anything money you raise is going into making the film. So, I've had to find and think about ways in which to survive and to make a living and also to continue to practice my craft and continue to be a film uh, filmmaker and a storyteller. And so working in television and television drama particularly uh, has been wonderful. I mean, I did directed an episode of Queen Sugar when Ava DuVernay uh, invited me to do that a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And then I did Law and Order SVU earlier this year. And I think that, you know, um, both of the those experiences were really enjoyable because I was continuing to work as a director, as a filmmaker. I'm working with actors. I am working with somebody else's script and try, and telling that they're the story that they've written, um, working with, you know, really great crews and well-resourced sort of, you know, uh, organizations. And so I think, um, you know, I want to do more of that and, and, um, and stories that have meaning, you know. That's wonderful. We look forward to more and more stories from you, more and more movies from you, more and more of your insights. And thank you so much, Pratibha Parmar, for this wonderful conversation from starting from Andrea and ending with storytelling and rom-coms and crime thrillers. We look forward to all of it. Thank you so much, Rashira. It was great to talk with you as always. Thank you. I'm Ruchira Gupta and thank you for listening to A Free Voice. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at ruchiragupta.com. The podcast is produced by Ram Devineni with Ratapalix and Bauri Poetry. Special thanks to Leela Kapoor and Anika Kothari. This podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund 
which is sponsored by the US Department of State and implemented by Global Ties US in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Additional support from New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature.